You're listening to Miss Style, Strength, and Grace with Deidre Murphy. This is your one-stop shop for style, fashion, health, and fitness. Deidre's passion is to help empower women to reach their fullest potential, both inside and out. Deidre and her guests will be discussing how to develop your style, health, and lifestyle hacks to energize your day and inspire you to keep reaching higher levels of success. Deidre is a professional fashion stylist, health guru, and Mrs. Washington 2017. It's time to get open and honest with Deidre. Well, hello and welcome. I'm excited to have you here today. Today, we are talking about thankfulness. As we're entering the season of giving and all things that relate to the holidays, I wanted to take a moment and talk about one of my morning routines and why it just helps me get into a good mental state. And recently, I was doing some of my morning reflection and meditation time, and I realized how thankful I am for the bad in life. Lately, we don't really always focus on, you know, the the horrible things that have happened to us, but I think it's important to go back and really think about those things and think about how they've shaped you to become who you are. So that's what we are discussing today. So on Monday, I like to do a little Monday in the mirror self-reflection time and really just hone in on, on what I've been dealing with and or like the weekend and how did I stay on track? Maybe what are some things I can improve upon? And just the other day on Monday morning, I was doing my morning meditation and thankfulness. And I learned this morning practice actually from Tony Robbins. So I didn't make it up, I, although I'd love to take credit for it. He's definitely the one that you know, inspired me to start doing this. And it was all because I went to the Unleash the Power Within big seminar this summer over in Newark, New Jersey, which that's another topic we can talk a lot about, which that was a life-changing experience. Five days, you're just completely surrounded by like-minded people and this positive energy and flow. And he taught us what he calls priming. So if you think of priming your day, it helps you get in the right mental state to have your day set up for success. So if you're a makeup guru like myself, you know, you might use primer on your face before you put on foundation. So that way it helps, you know, set the skin for that product that you're going to put on. Same thing with like paint or whatever. You would prime a wall before you would paint it. Well, same thing with this morning ritual. You prime yourself to have your day go as you want. And not that everything goes perfect, but it helps get you in that good positive mental state so that you can really take on whatever tasks you need to for that entire day and get everything done in a a positive mental clarity. So the the overview of it is you start out with three minutes of thankfulness and you go through about a minute each of thinking of things that you're thankful for. I like to do two big, you know, life-changing things that I'm thankful for and then even something small just to remind myself to be grateful for the small little blessings in life. I remember one of the things sometimes I I think about that's one of my small ones is this last winter, we had a terrible winter in our, our town with snowfall we hadn't seen on records for 60 years. And for days at a time, I was actually stuck in the house because my little car couldn't get out of our driveway. Uh, I'd have to rely on my husband letting me like borrow the truck or anything like that. And I just remember thinking back one of the days I was enjoying a really hot cup of coffee, looking outside as all the snow was falling. And I'm just truly, I was like grateful for that hot cup of coffee on a really, really cold winter's day. So it could be something small like that to something really big, like I'm really thankful that I won Mrs. Washington back in May. And that's one of the things that I envision. And you put yourself back into that perspective and back into that moment when whatever it was, whether it was like a sporting event, a a wedding, you know, a, a birth of somebody. And you put yourself back in that situation to really bring back those, those gratitude feelings. So that's kind of the first three minutes. Then you go into envisioning this, you know, light and universal power coming through your body and healing your body, giving you strength, giving you wisdom. And, you know, if you're a believer in God, then you might envision that, that power coming from God. Maybe you're just a believer in like a higher power. And so you envision like the universe sending you this power. I personally envision, you know, God sending this light and this love into my body and healing my body. 
And then you send love like via a prayer or a blessing to those around you, even if it's not somebody you necessarily know personally, but it could be friends, family, loved ones, whatever. And you envision that same light and energy going to them and healing their bodies and healing their spirits and, you know, just really praying for them. So you spend about a about three minutes doing that process as well. And then the last three minutes, you envision and see goals, three of them, like they've already happened. So it's in my mind, really about manifesting those types of goals. And again, I like to use like two big ones and maybe one small one. Sometimes mine are always big goals that I want to have make happen, but you really put yourself in that situation and you envision it like it's already there. So for instance, if your personal goal is maybe a weight loss goal, you would envision yourself stepping on the scale and seeing that goal number on the scale, jumping up and down with excitement because you've attained that goal and that freedom, but not only envisioning what's happening in that moment, but you know, what is that going to bring to your life? So if your goal is maybe weight loss, what would that do for your life? It'd be more energy, more production, longevity with your family, friends, loved ones, whatever it is for you. So as I was doing my morning ritual of thankfulness and priming, as Tony Robbins would call it on Monday morning, I actually realized that I was thankful for some crap, (laughs) some crap that's happened in my life. And in order to really fully explain that, let's go into kind of the story of my upbringing and my childhood. So I grew up in this small town of Tri-Cities, which really isn't even that small. It's like 250,000 people, but to me, it's it's a small town. And I grew up as a, a pastor's kid. Our church that we attended was pretty small. And when I say small, I mean like 30 people small. <laughs> and it was this small community, small church. But I grew up in a world where as kids, my brother and I had to put on the appearance of being perfect. So I wasn't allowed to know wear certain things around certain people, even though I might be able to wear that outfit, you know, in another setting. So for instance, I was a cheerleader in high school and my parents were okay with that. They let me do cheerleading. I loved it. It was a passion of mine. And I couldn't talk about being a cheerleader to, you know, people from church or even my mom's side of the family because they were uber conservative. Like I wasn't allowed to talk about it because (gasps) cheerleaders wore short skirts. Oh my goodness. Their skirts were above their knee. Oh dear Lord. So I wasn't allowed to talk about those things and like share that piece of my world with, you know, people from our church or or family members. And we always had to put on this, like I said, this air of being perfect. It was almost like we were trained as kids to live a double life. And, you know, unfortunately, I I think it goes down to the fact that my dad led a a double life. So it was, like I said, a very conservative home, but it was also abusive. So both emotionally, mentally, physically I grew up in a home where I never knew what was going to set off my dad and one of his rages, but I could see it flip in his face. So for instance, if I knew something was about to set him off, it was like this fog came over his eyes and I knew that things were going to get bad. Like shit was going to get real really quick. And I never, I learned to never really treasure any of my personal belongings or property because it might end up being ruined and smashed by my dad. And there was a lot of nights where either myself or my mom would end up calling the police to break up whatever situation was happening at home. Especially when my brother was a teenager and living at home because they butted heads tremendously. And, you know, it always ended up in physical altercations. And I was scared. I was five years younger than my brother. Still am five years younger than him. <laughs> and, you know, as a little kid, I would find the phone and, and dial 911 just to, to help break up the situation. And, you know, there was numerous times where I ended up with bruises myself. And I remember one time, like, changing in the locker room in PE in middle school and having to go into the stall for the girls' room to change clothes because I was embarrassed about a giant bruise on my hip. (sighs) Anyway, so like I said, that was the house that we lived at, that we grew up in. And and nobody knew about that because, you know, we're the pastor's family. We can't have dirty little secrets. And in my early twenties, so I guess I was probably 23, 24, 
I also learned about my dad's other life. So not only, you know, did we deal with all this garbage at home, but then he had also had numerous extramarital affairs on my mom, uh, stemming back to when they first got married all throughout their marriage. And then at that time, he already had a mistress living in Western Washington. So that's about three hours away from us. And I learned about all this coming to light. And at the time I was still single and they were going through the divorce because I finally helped. Well, I finally saw my mom, you know, divorce my dad. It took about a year for her to get the strength to kick him out and divorce him. And long story short, (laughs) wait, are my stories ever short? No, but anyway, they finally divorced. He moved to the other side of the state to be near his lady friend. And, you know, during all this time, like this crap that was happening, I finally met Chris, which is now my husband. And, you know, it took a while at first for me to open up about everything that was going on because I didn't want him to know what I was going through. B, I didn't want him to feel afraid of dating me. I felt damaged. I was like, wow, if my family can't even keep it together and I've never seen a healthy marriage relationship, what man is going to want to marry me when I don't know how to bring that good relationship into a marriage? And he came from a home where his parents are still married. They have a, a loving relationship. So he'd always seen a very positive male and female interaction. And I was worried that he would you know, not want me because I was damaged goods. And looking back, you know, as I was thinking about this all on Monday, I was like, wow, you know, I, I really am finally at to a point where I'm thankful for all the bad. So because of the abusive relationships that I saw between my mother and father and between, you know, my dad and me, as far as like the physical abuse going on at home, I realized that there were some good results because of a crappy situation. When I finally met Chris, you know, I had gotten to this point where I had seen red flags that were similar behaviors from my father and other men. So for instance, there was a a man that I dated in college and he had a lot of the same red flags as my dad. And it took me a long time to have those issues come to light in my mind and realize that I was no longer going to stand for that type of behavior. I realized that, you know, abuse was never okay. I finally realized that abuse doesn't always have to be physical, but also a mental and emotional thing and manipulation. So I finally just started to understand these red flags. And when I was still dating and single, I was like, nope, on to the next. Like if I saw these red flags or I started to see the jealousy or the manipulation from a, you know, boyfriend, I just would break up with them and, and go on to the next. And I, I realized that I didn't need to feel bad about that. I shouldn't feel like a, you know, a bad girl because I was breaking up with a guy after, you know, a few weeks of dating him. It was just like, no, that's not the person that I want to be with. And I'm not going to stand for that type of behavior. And I realized too, that I'm never going to change a man. You know, there's, there's little traits that we might be able to help improve upon with a partner. But when it comes to the core of who that person is, we're never going to change them. And it took me a long time. And it really took me seeing that behavior and seeing that divorce from my parents to teach me that. So I ended up finding an amazing spouse. He treats me like a queen before I even became Mrs. Washington. He's always treated me like a queen and he actually does things to provide for me. He makes sure I'm in a house, you know, with working parts that are always in order. I remember looking back into my, you know, growing up in childhood and if the sink stopped working or something in the house like got broke, it really, my dad let it go. And it took maybe my mom trying to get the tools out and trying to fix it herself that finally he'd be like, oh, okay, I'll finally fix it. And that bugged me so much that I, you know, I was able to find a man that when something does go wrong in the house, he gets his tools out and he fixes it. And if he physically can't fix it, he finds somebody to take care of the matter. <laughs> and, you know, he's become that same person person to my mom. He helps take care of her, you know, whether it's something around the house or even last winter with all that crazy snow, we went over there to her house and he was shoveling snow on our, out of her driveway to help take care of her, you know, ripped out a bunch of carpet in her house and found all this beautiful hardwood flooring in her home in the last couple months 
and you know, he's just really been able to kind of be that great son-in-law for my mom. And that, you know, I'm so thankful for that because if I hadn't gone through all this, I wouldn't have met Chris and then he wouldn't be able to share his love with my mom, who I'm really, really close with. And it also led me to realize that I became a lot closer with my brother. You know, he's five years older than me and that's such a big age gap that, you know, when I was going through kind of the, the growing up life changes, high school you know, developing who I was as a person, he was already out of the house. Actually, I think if I remember right, he had already moved down to Portland, Oregon by the time I was in high school. And then when I was in college, again, still, you know, developing as a person and learning who I was, he ended up moving down to California. So, you know, it was a little bit harder, harder on us to have a good, really close relationship. And then as all this kind of came to light, you know, and I started sharing with my brother like what was really going on at home he hadn't seen it like he didn't know anything that was going on because he lived you know 2,000 miles away and didn't really understand what my mom was dealing with and it helped he and I become closer because I was able to share things that were on my heart and last year actually I went down to visit he and his fiance down in California and you know, he and I spent a good day just hanging out with one another. <laughs> like we went to miniature golf, we went and got coffee, we had breakfast. Actually, it was more like brunch because I like to sleep in. And, you know, it just really brought us closer as we were able to start to develop a relationship based on a friendship. <laughs> and then I look at my mom and I see the good results that have happened for her. You know, she's no longer dependent on an abusive man and she's become independent. She has freedom like she never had before, and she's learned to rely on herself. If she wants to take a little road trip, she's welcome to do it. Last year, actually, I guess it was two years ago, she went to Australia by herself. And, you know, I talked about, I think in a a previous podcast that I lived in Australia for about three years growing up. That's another story, but she went back there and visited friends, and she would have never done that when she was still kind of tied down to my dad and you know, she has to work really hard. She has now two jobs at one point in the last few years, she was working three jobs just to make sure that she was making ends meet. But you know, now she's has this independence and she now has two jobs. So she's, you know, going down and in, in the amount of hours that she's doing things, but she's so driven and I think, I see that in her now. At one point last year in the winter time, she had to go down, put on coveralls and a jumpsuit and turn on her own pilot light with all the creepy crawlies and bugs underneath the house. And I was like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. But, you know, she she had to. And she's learned that she if she wants something done, she has to do it herself. And now I, I get to share the house that I have with Chris as a warm and welcoming house with her and other family members and friends. You know, growing up because of this kind of, you know, house that we had, I a never felt comfortable having friends over. I was always worried that, you know, my dad might get set off and then that he'd go into a rage while my friend was over and that would be embarrassing. And B, because, you know, he would let things kind of go to just, yeah, he'd let things go to crap on the house that I felt embarrassed to have friends over and even see my home that I was growing up in. So now I get to have this home that I've curated and I've, you know, made it into a warm and welcoming environment and I get to have my mom over and, you know, friends over and, and really feel that, that love and that family sense here in my own house. You know, I, I don't speak to my dad anymore, but it's not because I hate him or that I wish ill upon him. I simply choose not to put people in my life that will bring me heartache and pain. You know, but I can look at my life growing up and my childhood now with a place of thankfulness and knowing that I wouldn't be the woman that I am today with without that situation. I've learned that I have strength and that I have independence and that I was able to reach for my own dreams. And, you know, there's things that I look back and I admire about my dad. He actually loved to work on old hot rods and old cars, excuse me, 
And he was actually really, really gifted at it. He had a great craftsmanship for welding and, and creating beautiful custom pieces for cars. And although I'm not into cars, like, I mean, I have an appreciation for cars and I probably know more about old cars than, than most girls, but that same appreciation for beauty and, and creativity, I now, now get to use and curate with my love of art and fashion and kind of using fashion as my, my art medium and women as my canvas. So that that's helped me learn that I can appreciate, you know, the beauty and the aesthetic value in our world. So I shared my story today just to, to help inspire you and hopefully maybe you can think of some some horrible things in your life that you can be thankful for. You know, it may take time, but if you think about who you are, the person you've become, it's all based on the environment and the situations you've learned from. So I encourage you to start to be grateful for at least one negative life circumstance. Maybe even you can start a morning ritual like the priming and the meditation for a time of reflection. You'll be able to start your your day in an attitude of gratitude, especially as we enter the holiday seasons when, you know, so much focus is on commercialism and greed. And that's all I have for you today. As always, I love you all and have a great day. Hey ladies, thanks for listening. And we hope you enjoyed today's episode to help empower more women. Please be a doll and rate review and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes and other free resources we mentioned today, go to stylebydeidra.com.